Uh, good morning. Um, buenos dias. My name is uh, Carlos Bea, and I am a judge on the Ninth Circuit Court of Appeal. For those of you who are not um, too acquainted with us, the Ninth Circuit Court of Appeal is a federal appellate court, Tribunal de Segunda Instancia, of in federal cases for the nine western states and our jurisdiction goes from Montana uh, over to Idaho, Washington, Oregon, Alaska, and then we go out to the Mariana Islands off the coast of Japan, Guam, and then we come back to California, Nevada, and Arizona, and Oregon. Um, so it, it was a pleasure uh, to be invited here, it's particularly a pleasure to listen to Doug Ginsburg with his expertise about um, competitive matters. He was quite right in saying that the judges of the federal circuits are generalists and we'll have some talk about specialized courts. I think it's a good idea to have talk. But I'm here to tell you to uh, um, to introduce you to a panel, a distinguished panel, that's going to talk about antitrust matters uh, and later about class actions. When I was listening to Doug Ginsburg discuss the trajectory of antitrust enforcement in the United States and how many bad decisions we've made, I reflected on your recent experience here in Mexico in adopting antitrust law, and I was wondering why you, you want poverty in Mexico, why, why were you doing this? <laughs> and, I, and I thought something we say in Spain, todo se contagia menos la belleza. <laughs> Everything is contagious except good looks. <laughs> and so I thought, gee, uh, it's, uh, it's, it, you're taking on a big, a big burden. But then I thought maybe some of the thoughts that you'll hear expressed today from the panel will help guide you and prevent you from making the mistakes that the United States uh, judiciary has made over the years. And for that purpose, we have the panel that I'm about to introduce. Uh, the first uh, speaker, uh, first of all, the program is, is going to be this. Each panelist will have about 10 minutes to put forth his thoughts. Um, on the t subjects on which he'll speak, and then we'll have a period of time in which the panelists can ask questions of each other that are suggested by what they have said. Uh, then the panelists will wrap up their presentation, and then we'll open the uh, panel to questions from the floor. And we've left about 30 minutes for questions from the floor, so we have plenty of time to ask questions. All right, now, uh, leading off, the, uh, the panel will be uh, Don uh, Luis Lucatero, who is currently the head of regulatory policy within the Federal Communications Commission in Mexico. Luis Lucatero studied physics at Hokkaido University in Japan and continued graduate studies at L'Ecole Polytechnique in France. Luis Lucatero has 12 years of experience in telecommunications, having worked at Alcatel Lucent headquarters in France in a variety of positions ranging from research scientist, business developer, and head of wireless policy. Mr. Lucadero, Lucadero has advised various governments in telecommunications policy in Europe, India, Latin America, and Africa, and plays a major role as an activist for internet usage as agent of societal transformation and uh, Mr. Lucadero will give a general explanation of antitrust enforcement in Mexico, the role of COFECO, and the courts. Um, next will be uh, Gregory Sedak. Mr. Sedak is the founder and chairman of Criterion Economics, LLC, uh, a Washington, D.C., and Ronald Coase professor of law and economics at Tilburg University in the Netherlands. He is an internationally recognized expert on antitrust, intellectual property, regulation of network industries, and complex economic litigation. Professor Sedak has testified 
as an expert witness in scores of proceedings before courts, regulatory commissions, international commercial arbitration panels, and committees of Congress. He has served in the U.S. government as both an economist and a lawyer. Professor Sedak has been a consultant to the Antitrust Division of the U.S. Department of Justice, the Republic of Mexico, and the Competition Bureau of Canada, as well as to major corporations in North America, Europe, Asia, and Australia. Professor Sedak edits the Journal of Comp Competition Law and Economics for the U Oxford University Press and has written extensively on antitrust, intellectual property, and regulation. His books and articles have been cited by the Antitrust <coughs> Division, the Federal Trade Commission, the Federal Communications Commission, the Supreme Court of the United States, the Supreme Court of Canada, the European Commission, the U.S. Court of Appeals for the D.C. Circuit, the Supreme Court of California, and many other courts and regulatory commissions. Professor Sedak has taught at the Yale School of Management and the Georgetown University Law Center. He was educated at Stanford University and clerked for Judge Richard A. Posner of the Seventh Circuit. Then, and, and Mr. Um, Sedak will be talking about law and economic principles and dominant firm conduct in the market. Then we have the pleasure of having Professor George L. Priest from Yale Law School. Professor Priest is the Edward Phelps Professor of Law and Economics and Kaufman Distinguished Research Scholar in Law, Economics, and Entrepreneurship on leave spring 2012. He is a professor of law and economics and Kaufman Distinguished Research Scholar in Law at Yale Law School. Before coming to Yale, he taught at the University of Chicago, the State University of New York at Buffalo, and UCLA. His subject areas are antitrust, capitalism or democracy, products liability, regulated industries, insurance and public policy, constitutional law, federalism, state and local government law, and civil procedure. Professor Priest has a BA from Yale and a, a Doctor of Law from the University of Chicago. His BA of Yale was 1969, as JD from University of Chicago, 1973, and he tells me that his most distinguished achievement was being in the same class as Judge Ginsburg, who just spoke to you. So with that, I'd like to turn over the microphone over to uh, Don Luis Locatero, uh, who's going to give you an, an explanation of antitrust enforcement in Mexico, the role of COFECO, and the courts. Thank you. In fact, there is a little change in the, in the program of what I'm going to talk. And um, I, um, I, I'm head of wireless policy, in a, not, not head of wireless policy, head of regulatory policy for, for COFETEL. And in fact, I'm part of an experiment that, uh, that the Mexican government is doing. I'm a physicist, I'm not a lawyer. And, um, and in fact, I, I have been analyzing how networks work, how, how the costs of, uh, of network deployments and, uh, and network uh, usage as a, as a revenue generator work. And I have been discussing with governments around the world in the last few years. I was brought to Mexico the 1st of July uh, for the things I have done, but also for the fact that I, I don't know anyone in Mexico. I have no friends. <laughs> so a physicist that knows a lot about networks and has no friends in Mexico, to be the head of regulatory policy for Mexico, knowing that he believes that internet will change the world. Now, um, this being said, I would like to talk about a, an example of price squeeze in Mexico. And, um, and I would like to say before, before I start that I, I really believe that, uh, that uh, network operators play a major role in society and that, uh, and that regulation should not destroy them. Regulation should, should help them do a better job so that they bring social cohesion, so that they defragment supply and demand, so that um, re they reduce transactional costs for Mexicans. Please know that 32 million Mexicans prefer to waste time and move uh, instead of making a phone call. 32 million Mexicans. And, um, and something else is that we want to, re to reduce undesirable market effects. 
This is why we're doing policy. Now, where, where are we in terms of telecoms in Mexico? Well, the, the fact is that uh, the telecommunications market generates something of the order of 2.5% of the, of the Mexican GDP. And, um, well, this may sound like a lot, but when you compare it to Colombia, for example, Col in Colombia, telecommunications generates about 4.5% of the GDP, and in Brazil, uh, no, in, in, in Brazil, 4.5%, and in Colombia, something of the order of 5%. So uh, we believe that uh, probably something could be done in, in such a way that uh, operators make more money, and, uh, and, uh, and something that could, um, that could happen would be to, to help uh, operators in a certain way to have a better penetration, to induce more minutes of use among, um, among subscribers, and to, and to make the, the, the Mexican market less, um, um, less uh, stagnant. Um, so uh, what, we, what we see is that uh, there is some kind of uh, social damage that, uh, that has been achieved because, well, that, that, that has been the result of, uh, of poor penetration in, in several parts of Mexico we see that uh, people with high purchasing power have better connectivity than people with low purchasing power. And that, uh, and that the, the rules of, um, of, um, of allocating spectrum to, to operators have been, uh, have been very kind to operators. And, uh, and there, are no, there are no strict coverage and capacity um, um, uh, obligations for operators that, uh, that, would, uh, that would bring connectivity everywhere. Now, uh, if we look at the entry barriers, to, to, to solve this problem. We see that uh, having a spectrum and deploying a, a, a multi-billion dollar network is something that is extremely expensive. And something that uh, since the 1st of July that I, that I joined Cofetel ha have, been, have been studying is the, the performance of mobile virtual operators in Mexico. And uh, to my surprise, I, I, I realized that mobile virtual operators in Mexico don't exist. And, um, when, when, when you compare this to the case of, 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 the, of the Netherlands, for example, in the Netherlands there are 28 uh, uh, virtual operators in, in, in a small country that is, that is about as big as the, as the District of Federal and, and the state of Mexico. And uh, in Mexico you have none. And, um, and something that, that some of, the, of those that have analyzed the Mexican market in terms of uh, coming and, and opening a, 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 a mobile virtual operator have been have been saying that uh, that it is very difficult because the price that they would they would get for for uh, for for, for, for wholesale um, connectivity is so high that when they when they go to the retail market they would have absolutely no margins. So um, this doesn't apply to one single operator. It's uh, it's in general something that has been uh, that has been uh, identified to the to the behavior of, of many many operators. And uh, and something that we believe is that. Opening the, the fixing this problem would actually fix the uh, would actually help the operators. What we have seen, for example, when we have analyzed this matter, is that uh, in France, for example, 10% of the mobile subscribers, the overall mobile subscribers, have been added into the market uh, by by mobile virtual operators, and this has not created damage actually to the, to the existing operators. Um, we. Um, we ha what we have realized is that uh, when you analyze the cost structure of, um, of, uh, of delivering um, uh, mobile, tele mo mobile connectivity service, there is a subscriber acquisition cost, and there is the subscriber retention cost, and some of the little costs that could be easily transferred to the, to the, to the mobile virtual operators, and this way um, fix some of the supply and demand for connectivity problems that, uh, that we have in Mexico. And, um, and we believe that helping somehow uh, virtual operators to, to exist in the market, far from, from destroying value for, for, for the existing players, would, um, would, um, would actually bring value to the Mexican society and to the existing players. Um, we, we have identified this, this, uh, this price squeeze problem, and, um, and we believe that is something that could be fixed if we, if we sit down and talk together. Uh, I will not talk about the role of Cofeco and um, and uh, and, the, and the relationship between uh, between uh, between Cofeco and um, and Cofetel. I'm not a lawyer, but uh, I am a, I'm rather a network economics expert. But um, if you have any more questions, uh, please please um, approach me. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Mr. Lugadero. And now we'll uh, turn to Professor Sidak. Thank you. 
Judge uh, Ginsburg did a great job this morning of summarizing uh, the evolution of U.S. antitrust law. I would like to place my comments this morning uh, in, in the context of, of his overview. Uh, Mexico is at a point uh, where, with its, its uh, uh, relatively new statute, it will uh, be making uh, key decisions uh, by COFECO and by the courts that will interpret the statute uh, in the same way that the U.S. courts, including the U.S. Supreme Court, has interpreted the Sherman Act uh, for more than a century. And as Judge uh, Ginsburg's comments indicated, the, uh, the nature of that interpretation in terms of how much economic sophistication it contains uh, will have a, tr a tremendous impact on uh, the shape of the law. Uh, the, the large case now, of course, that, that uh, uh, we see here in Mexico is, is the Telcel case, of a, a margin squeeze case. And uh, this case, I think, pr uh, presents the opportunity for uh, Mexican uh, antitrust enforcement uh, uh, officials and, and the courts to make clear what the uh, overriding objectives are of Mexican antitrust law. I would like to make some uh, points this morning about uh, the consumer welfare approach of American antitrust law and why I think that would be uh, the desirable way for Mexican law to evolve. <coughs> uh, let me also uh, make some more specific comments about margin squeeze. Uh, in the United States we had uh, an important Supreme Court decision uh, about three years ago called Link Line, which uh, factually is very similar to the Telcel case, except that it involved DSL service instead of wireless service. And it was a Supreme Court decision. And uh, in that case, the Supreme Court uh, uh, held that uh, there was no uh, separate cause of action under antitrust law for a margin squeeze. There could still be a regulatory uh, cause of action for margin squeeze, but not under antitrust law. Uh, and the, uh, uh, the, the, the point that the court was making was that if the duty of the vertically integrated firm to uh, make available uh, some input on a wholesale basis is something that doesn't come from antitrust law, if it's not an antitrust duty to begin with, then the terms on which that uh, input is sold to competitors uh, can't be the basis for uh, an antitrust violation. Um, in, in the Linkline case, the retail price that was being charged to consumers was above cost. It was not a predatory price, so there was not a predatory pricing problem. And the, uh, the wholesale price that was being charged uh, by uh, uh, AT&T's operating company to its competitors at the, whole, at the wholesale level uh, was also a lawful price. Um, uh, in link line and uh, uh, and so if there is not uh, illegality at either one of those prices then the margin between them can't uh, be the basis for for illegality uh, I think that leads then so the first point then is is the uh, uh, examination of the margin something that arises under antitrust law under, or under uh, regulation and if you have a sector specific regulator there are good reasons why it should be handled by uh, the regulator rather than the antitrust official. And one uh, powerful argument, I think, in favor of that is uh, just the sheer complexity of trying to oversee a margin as opposed to a, an absolute price, whether it's the wholesale price or the retail price. In the United States, before the link line case, back in the 1940s, there was a famous uh, antitrust decision uh, involving Alcoa, the big aluminum company which made aluminum ingot and sold that raw material uh, downstream to companies that would fabricate the aluminum into sheet. Alcoa itself was also vertically integrated in the manufacture of sheet. In that case, the downstream fabricators went to the, the U.S. government and said, we're subject to a price squeeze here. The, the price that we're paying for the ingot, the wholesale input here, is too high relative uh, to the 
retail price that Alcoa is selling its fabricated sheet for in the downstream market. And in uh, that case, a very famous uh, American uh, judge, learned hand, uh, talked about Alcoa's duty to uh, allow a living profit for these downstream firms and that it could not charge more than a fair price for the ingot as an input uh, to the fabricated uh, aluminum sheet. Now, as Judge Ginsburg explained this morning, this decision was 1945. It wasn't until about the 70s that American antitrust jurisprudence radically changed and incorporated economic analysis very explicitly. So by the time Linkline comes along in uh, 2009, uh, this conversion of antitrust jurisprudence in the United States to something that explicitly incorporates economic analysis has fully taken place. And the, th the thinking in the Alcoa decision that antitrust law should be concerned about whether or not competitors are able to make a sufficient profit margin is completely passe. So it was no surprise that the link line case came out the way it did. It came out in favor of, of the vertically integrated firm not having any uh, antitrust liability because there was no cause of action that would be recognized by the Supreme Court. Uh, but the, the, the case, and, and the Supreme Court in essence uh, overruled uh, Alcoa on price squeeze to the extent there was any remaining doubt that, the, that Alcoa was good law. Now, to an American antitrust lawyer, that would be quite unsurprising for the reasons that Judge Ginsburg pointed out uh, this morning, but we see factually identical price squeeze cases arising in the telecommunications industry in Europe with the opposite uh, results taking place where antitrust liability is imposed on uh, a vertically integrated telecommunications carrier. So uh, there is a fundamental choice that Mexico faces, whether to uh, look at the American approach or look at the European approach to, to price squeeze cases uh, in general and in, in the telecommunications industry uh, specifically. The experience in the United States has been that attempting to use antitrust law as a way to regulate prices, let alone regulate margins, which as I said before is much harder, uh, is, is not a successful exercise. The Bell system, the integrated AT&T telephone network that began a century ago, was broken up uh, effective January 1, 1984. And from 1984 until the Telecommunications Act of 1996 was enacted, Many uh, regulatory uh, decisions involving <coughs> the, the, the former Bell Network were essentially made by a single federal district court judge in Washington, D.C. It was a very litigious, protracted process. Uh, despite all of that uh, effort to use antitrust as a kind of de facto regulatory tool uh, in a vertically integrated telecommunications uh, industry. The court in Washington never tried to be a price regulator and never tried to do anything remotely like regulating margins uh, because even that would be far too complicated uh, uh, an effort for, for the court to undertake. So it's this complexity uh, th in the setting and, and regulating of prices it is something that it's, uh, it's an ongoing process, it's a fact-intensive process, uh, and it's something that uh, is more uh, suited to an expert sector-specific regulatory body than the process of antitrust litigation, which is based on putting together a factual record and then determining liability on that factual record, not having a continually changing factual record over time. Uh, Another aspect of this, because of the complexity of, of trying to regulate margins uh, in an industry uh, like telecommunications, uh, one has to ask what advice does an antitrust lawyer give his client? And, and I think it's useful 
uh, to look for a moment at, at the Telcel decision here that Cofeco issued. It's a very complex, lengthy decision, probably 500 pages. I've only read the English translation. Uh, and as someone who's worked in both telecommunications regulation and antitrust, my reaction to it was that it read much more like a very detailed Federal Communications Commission order rather than something like the Microsoft antitrust decision, which was probably 50 or 75 pages. The longer uh, a decision is and the more factually complex it is, the harder it is for a lawyer to come away from it and say to his client, here's the advice I can give to you tomorrow if you were to ask me uh, whether a change in my retail price uh, in response to competition, a dropping of the retail price, would be, uh, be anti-competitive uh, as a matter of margin squeeze law in antitrust law in Mexico. Now, I think apart from these considerations, the biggest cause of concern with respect to margin squeeze as an antitrust theory of liability is that it focuses on competitor welfare rather than consumer welfare. Uh, this is exactly what Judge Ginsburg was saying. American antitrust law wrestled with for about 70 years before finally deciding that the antitrust laws were not a tool of industrial policy. They were not a tool of preserving a certain kind of market structure for aesthetic reasons or cultural reasons. But they were focused on creating uh, the opportunity for uh, competitors to create the best uh, outcomes for consumers. The problem with threatening a firm, a vertically integrated firm with antitrust liability, if its competitors cannot achieve a, a desired level of profitability, is that now that, that vertically integrated firm faces a choice. Given the complexity of the rules that it has to follow uh, over the margins, uh, it, it can try to uh, uh, still be an aggressive competitor but face the risk of antitrust liability. Or it can simply raise its retail price and relax, knowing that if its retail price is higher, then even the, le the least efficient of its competitors are not going to complain that they're being squeezed between the, the wholesale price and the retail price. And so what you, you end up with is something that is a kind of government-managed cartel, which if pursued privately by competitors in a market, would be condemned as a price-fixing conspiracy. But yet it's the predictable outcome of a price squeeze rule of liability that makes it attractive for the, the leading vertically integrated, in, uh, integrated <coughs> firm in the market to choose the, the quiet life. To, to set its price high, be a price leader, allow its competitors to make a, a, a sufficient amount of profit, even though consumers pay a higher price. Now, in Europe, uh, in the Deutsche Telekom price squeeze case, uh, the European Court of Justice actually said, well, uh, even though Deutsche Telekom was regulated at the wholesale level and could not change its wholesale price, uh, uh, it didn't face any, any great risk here of compliance with uh, the margin squeeze rule because uh, it could raise its retail price to, to its German consumers. Uh, that's the, the fundamental dichotomy that, that faces policymakers in Mexico today. Do you want uh, a rule that's very complex and that induces a vertically integrated firm to opt to be a price leader and avoid uh, aggressive price competition to the detriment of consumers? Or do you want uh, a, an antitrust regime that encourages robust competition that lowers prices for consumers? Uh, I think I'll, I'll stop at that point. I th I'm sure George has some additional thoughts uh, related to the, the uh, price squeeze theory. Okay. Uh, thank you. I, 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 I hope I have some additional thoughts. I, I want to talk about uh, 
this issue of price squeeze a little differently than uh, Greg has. I'd like to talk about the basic economics of price squeeze claims, both the price squeeze claims against Telcel, which I'm sure you're all familiar with, but we've also seen, as Greg has pointed out, these claims raised in the United States recently against Linkline, as he mentioned earlier, against Alcoa. Uh, and there, there have been other similar claims, related claims against other telecommunication firms in the United States. Uh, so I'm going to be addressing basically the same issue that Mr. Lucatero addressed, but from a different standpoint from the way Greg addressed it, dealing with the regulatory issues, the complexity, uh, and, and the like. And, I, and I'd like to start by, by posing a simple economic question. Imagine in the telecommunications industry that there is a single largest firm, like Telcel or like Alcoa was in uh, aluminum back in the uh, 50s. But we would expect that really in telecommunications. As Mr. Lucatero pointed out, telecommunications is a network industry. And in all network, or in many, pr probably all network industries, uh, we're very likely to have a single largest firm that provides service at the lowest cost and at lowest prices to consumers. So again, basic assumption first, telecommunications, largest firm, that, that firm over some range provides a service at the lowest prices. Now, second uh, assumption, Th the largest firm has no specific duty to provide service to competing firms, but can do so either by contract or where the firms can't agree on a contract by regulatory approval of terms, this, which is what I understand the situation in Mexico, and it's similar to the situation in the United States. So those are the, those are the background assumptions. The basic economic question that I want to ask, and I think we have, to, we have to ask to deal with these price squeeze claims, is this. When and on what conditions will that largest firm enter contracts with competing firms to provide competing service. Now again, no duty to do so, but, but there, under what economic conditions will the largest firm decide uh, to do so? That it's in the benefit of the largest firm to enter these contracts. And the economic answer, I think, is pretty simple. The economic answer is that wh where it is beneficial for the largest firm to enter those contracts uh, will be where competing firms have some comparative advantage in providing retail service uh, in telecommunications. Now, what would the c competitive advantage uh, be? It's not likely to be costs itself because, again, in a network industry, the largest firm is likely to have the lowest cost of providing the service and so be able to, to charge the lowest prices. But there are other forms of competitive advantage in providing retail uh, services. That is, the competing firm uh, might have customers uh, with established relations that the largest firm uh, doesn't have. It might have some geographic or affinity group advantage uh, over the uh, largest firm. But if the competing, next point though, and this is, the, this is the most important economic point, if the competing firms have such an advantage, then it will be in the interest of the largest firm to enter a contract with a competing firm uh, to provide it the wholesale service. Uh, and uh, because uh, the co competing firm can take advantage of its uh, whatever its comparative advantage is in providing broader service, and it will increase the profits of the largest firm to enter the contract with the competing firm. Now, if the competing firm does not have a comparative advantage, then there's no reason for the largest firm uh, to deal with it. The largest firm can provide the service itself. But if a competing firm has a comparative advantage in some, over some dimension, then it will be beneficial for the largest firm to enter uh, such contracts, and as we know, Telcel has entered uh, contracts of that nature. Other Alcoa in aluminum that Greg talked about had entered uh, contracts with fabricators and telecommunications uh, companies in the US, which are not as large as Telcel, but still are large, have entered uh, those uh, contracts. Um, so one question in, in dealing with Mr. Lucatero's point is, what exactly is the competitive advantage of mobile virtual operators that Telcel has not recognized. That is, I appreciate very much Mr. Lucatero from his uh, uh, physics background and his interest in uh, spreading the internet would like to have more vir mobile virtual operators, but if the mobile virtual operators do not have a comparative advantage to Telcel in providing service, what's the point of Telcel entering contracts with them to provide that uh, service? That's a basic economic uh, point. 
But let, let me go back to the basic, uh, the basic uh, let me address the price squeeze claim more directly now. So again, imagine a situation where, where we have a largest firm with cost advantage over a very large range, but has entered contracts with other competing carriers where those competing carriers have some uh, comparative advantage. Now ask the question, what happens if over time the cost structure changes or demand uh, changes in some regard so that the largest firm is able to reduce prices to consumers relative to what it was charging before? Well, as a general matter, we would want, to, and this is uh, the reverse, the converse of Greg's point, we would want the largest firm to do so. Where the largest firm can lower prices, uh, we want the largest firm to do so, and this will deal with the penetration problem that Mr. Lucatero uh, was dealing with. If the prices are lower, we're going to have more penetration where prices are lower. It's not clear from, from, except perhaps in models, it's not clear from actual experience, as I understand it here in Mexico, that mobile virtual operators can charge lower prices. If they could charge lower prices than Telcel, then it would be advantageous for Telcel to enter agreements uh, with them. If Telcel can charge the lowest prices, then it's not advantageous for Telcel to enter those agreements. It's advantageous for Telcel to lower its prices itself to increase penetration uh, in Mexico. But now, and this is the price squeeze claim, what if, again, we, have, uh, we imagine that the, the largest firm has there's some change in costs, some change in demand, it's able to lower its prices to consumers, but what if those lower prices eat away at the previous comparative advantage possessed by the competing firms. Uh, uh, again, why would that be? Well, the customer may decide, well, I've had a long relationship with this competing firm, uh, but on the other hand, the prices of Telcel or, or the largest firm are now so much lower, I'm going to switch. Uh, that could happen in, any time. But what do we want in that situation? Well, we want the consumer to switch to the service with the lower uh, prices, even though, again, viewed from the standpoint of a regulator, that looks like a price squeeze on the competing firms. We want the largest firm to lower its price uh, to consumers where it's able uh, to do so. This is the so-called price squeeze that COFECO is dealing with in the claims against Telcel and that were, have been dealt with in the United States, as Greg pointed out, in a variety of cases. Now, an alternative way of dealing with this problem is for the largest firm simply to quit dealing with the competing firms. If the competing firms don't have a comparative advantage, why should the largest firm uh, deal with them? Um, on the other hand, why don't we let the market determine that? Should, rather than making a categorical decision or, or forcing the largest firm to make a categorical decision to deal or not to deal at all, where it has no duty to deal with the competing firms, over time the market will show the extent to which the competing firm has a, continues to have a comparative advantage. It may be entirely that over time, the, whatever comparative advantage the competing firm had at the, in the first instance, it no longer has because of the ability of the largest firm to lower its prices. Uh, that would be determined by the market. But again, that's a telesale case. And that's a claim of price squeeze. The, the competing firms, those firms competing against Telcel, who have complained to Cofeco about Telcel's price squeeze, are those firms that are finding that Telcel's lower retail prices are, are are making whatever comparative advantage they had in the first instance uh, obsolete. And so they're, they're losing uh, sales. The, uh, as a consequence, it seems to me, and this was Greg's point too, the final resolution of COFECO, if, if it's affirmed, uh, will override these market dynamics and override the market dynamics to the detriment of consumers who otherwise uh, if not, if, if Telcel is not barred from lowering prices, would have the advantage of the lower prices that would lead to the, to the increased penetration of service uh, in Mexico. Who benefits from this? Well, the competing carriers benefit. Greg made this point, too. It's about benefiting uh, competitors. They, they are able to keep their business. If, 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 the, if the COFECO uh, resolution is affirmed, uh, those competitors will be able to keep their business those competing firms, even if they're not able to provide a comparative advantage in service to consumers. Uh, they won't have a comparative advantage, and a market advantage, but they'll have a regulatory advantage through, which is Greg's point too, through the act of uh, COFECO. So that the, these price squeeze claims are really, claim, as Greg pointed out, claims by competitors to try and protect competitors' position 
in contexts in which the largest firm is providing service at lower prices uh, to consumers and eating away at the comparative advantage, uh, the earlier comparative advantage of these competing firms. The, uh, a general policy that, that has, has largely been adopted in the United States, and I'll, I'm going pr to probably state it a little more bluntly than any court in the United States has, is that uh, policies to rein in a large firm that are promoted by competitors of that large firm are probably bad policies, probably terrible policies. That is, if, if the largest firm, firm is operating a, as a monopolist, take the alternative. The largest firm is operating as a monopolist and charging a monopoly price. Well, that's great for competitors because the competitors, this is a, the so-called umbrella theory in, in the US, where the largest firm is charging a monopoly price, the competing firms can charge a, a price just less than that and, uh, and stay in business. It's only where the largest firm's competitors are, are only upset about the behavior of a large firm where the, where the large firm is undercutting or underpricing the, uh, the, the, the uh, sales of the uh, competitor. And in that context, where competing firms see they are being underpriced or anticipate that they will be underpriced in the future, uh, what do they do? They go to the government to try and stop the uh, underpricing. Uh, the, where the government does so, it's bad for consumers, good for competitors. Have, is bad for there is um, the entry barrier to deliver telecommunication services is extremely high. For example, if we, if we compare the, the, the different carriers that you have today in Mexico, um, you have uh, Telcel that has, uh, that has something of the order of um, 12,000 sites, radio sites. Adding one more, adding a new radio site to your network costs a lot of money. And in fact, it, it affects time to market. Then Telefonica has a, a much smaller number of sites and, and then the other ones have less sites. What you have is that uh, if you want to compete uh, um, in, in the market of 112 million people and two million square kilometers, you need to have the coverage and capacity that is needed in order for you to, to actually play in the entire market. And the entry barriers are, are so, so large and the, and the disadvantages that come from the physics of the network. For example, if an operator has a certain type of spectrum uh, instead of, uh, of another type of spectrum, there could be a, a competitive disadvantage in the, in, in the cost of deploying a network. So what an operator, what a regulator can do is to try to balance the, 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 the physical limitations to, competi uh, to, the, to the competitivity of, of, uh, of, of, of operators. And for example, to try to balance the amount of spectrum in the right frequencies that, 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 uh, that, uh, that operators have. Something that we're doing is that we're trying to help uh, operators to have more radio sites. This is, this is one of the most important uh, policies that we're creating right now, to help operators to, to have many more towers than they have because what we have seen is that if you count the number of citizens that Mexico has per tower, it's, it's, you, it's basically four times as many as, as the United States, Europe, or Japan. And, uh, and so we, we see that there is, a, there is a, a, an infrastructure crisis in Mexico. And um, studying how to deal with frequencies, uh, how to deal with, with, with um, um, rights of way, and, uh, and some other issues actually will help uh, operators do a better job and make more money and help society be better connected. So the idea is that to reduce the price at the wholesale level to the retail competitors, thereby giving them more ability to invest in infrastructure? Well, we want to, we want to help uh, even out the, the way operators invest. That's, that's we, I mean, we, we really believe in competition. And, uh, and I think that Helping, helping a, a, a weak player uh, that, that doesn't make an effort and, uh, to, to, to survive is not healthy. But what we can do is to help uh, operators to, to actually have the tools to compete properly. Do uh, the two of you want to come in, comment on that? <coughs> sure. Um, sure. Uh, I think you can look at um, margin squeeze doctrine uh, as a kind of uh, competitor subsidy um, if, if you're regarding it as a tool for um, inducing network investment, for example. And, and the question, and, and in that sense, it's not qualitatively different from a lot of 
other kinds of regulatory policies, uh, such as unbundling of networks that explicitly, explicitly were intended to uh, encourage uh, entry by telecommunications carriers first, by leasing uh, parts of the network of the incumbent, and then eventually uh, by building their own facilities. Now, does that uh, model, uh, which was developed for landline telecommunications, for you know, fixed wireline networks, carry over uh, seamlessly to analysis of wireless networks? And I would submit it doesn't. Uh, the traditional story uh, that was given uh, by legislatures and regulators for imposing mandatory unbundling of networks at regulated prices uh, was that there was a, a landline bottleneck. There was a, nat there was a natural monopoly over the local loop, that it was not cost effective for an entrant to, to come in and lay down a competing local loop. And uh, the most efficient way to stimulate uh, facilities-based competition was to mandate that the incumbent lease the use of its facilities uh, at regulated prices to entrants until those entrants could build up sufficient uh, numbers of customers to justify making the sunk investments themselves to build out networks. So that was the story in 1996 under the U.S. Telecommunications Act. Uh, but factually, that doesn't map well into wireless telecommunications because wireless is not a natural monopoly. Uh, the, the number of service providers is a function of how much spectrum the government allocates relative to the, the natural physical characteristics for efficiently operating a, a wireless network. Uh, and so in, in the fixed line, uh, wireline uh, side of telecommunications, we would talk about uh, competitive local exchange carriers. Uh, these were the ones who were leasing the use of unbundled network elements. <coughs> uh, and the objective was that eventually they would invest in their own facilities. Now, would in a, uh, a mobile virtual network, network operator is uh, essentially the wireless counterpart to that. But uh, the ability uh, of an MVNO ultimately to uh, mature into a facilities-based wireless operator ultimately depends on, its, on the ability of uh, that uh, carrier to procure spectrum from the government. And, and the government is, is the entity that controls the ultimate amount of, of that resource, that spectrum resource. It's not, it's not uh, one of the other uh, existing wireless carriers. The amount of spectrum that is available is endogenously determined by the regulator. Uh, and so it's, I think it's, it's an inapt application of the unbundling model to the wireless sector to say that if we don't think there is uh, sufficient uh, competition today in wireless, the answer is to impose an unbundling regime on it. The answer is uh, allocate more spectrum. Can I comment? Or do you want to wait till my comments too? Uh -huh. Thanks. Because I have some comments on your points too. Uh, certainly, you're, certainly you're right. The entry barriers are high in telecommunications, possibly extremely high in Mexico given Telcel's uh, position. Uh, but I think we have to think about entry barriers and think about competition a little differently when we're talking about network industries than other industries. That is, telecommunications, even though there are some non-natural monopoly features of it, telecommunications are not like retail stores where we expect competition on every block. Uh, we, entry barriers are high in telecommunications and many other industries because they are network industries and because there are many advantages of having large networks. I think if we look around the world, what we see in telecommunications is the scale of operations increasing, not decreasing. Not, we're not going in the U.S. to 100 different carriers, wireless carriers. We're, in fact, in increasing scale. Now, Greg is quite correct that much of this derives from governmental decisions as to the allocation of spectrum. Uh, but to say that does, does, is not to say that the government ought to split up the 
uh, ought to split up the uh, spectrum and offer it to a thousand different carriers, that's not likely to be efficient for the uh, society. As we see, and I'm, I'm sure Mr. Lucatero knows this and is even more enthusiastic than I am, in telecommunications as in other features of the internet, we're having increasing interoperability between various uh, devices, uh, laptops, iPads, telephones, iPhones. The more interoperable they are, the better. That is likely to mean larger scope and scale for, for telecommunications and related internet uh, operations. But, that, but the implication of that is there's less competition in the, old, in the, in the traditional sense of retail stores or, or uh, um, restaurants competing against, uh, hundreds of them competing against each other, uh, uh, and, and more larger, uh, larger scale and scope uh, operations, which will mean inevitably uh, higher uh, uh, barriers to entry. Yeah, um, for example, when we have done our analysis of, of virtual operators, um, we, we actually um, came to, the, to, to, a, to a very specific case of, a, of an operator who wanted to move a base station from a non-profitable town into a profitable town. They wanted to move a base station from one place to the other because they were saying that the customers there were not good. And, uh, and in fact, something that, something that happened was that uh, somebody in that community said that he was able to get many customers to use the base stations if only he could become a mobile virtual operator. So the local lord there said that he could, he could solve an information asymmetry problem in a very efficient manner because the subscriber acquisition costs for the company in question were so high in order to get subscribers there that it was just not possible for this company that, that had this strategy department in Mexico City to, to, to completely understand the dynamics of that, of that small market. And this, and, this, uh, and this fellow was telling us that they could, they, the, the, the subscriber acquisition costs that they would have would be so low that in fact they would be able to fill that base station and, uh, and we, have, we have found a number of individuals who believe that they can, they can unlock a number of niche markets that, when you add them all together, uh, imply millions of people. So this is, this is, this is one of the reasons what, why we think that there is a number of subscribers that is waiting there for, to have connectivity that would not affect uh, the existing carriers, but, uh, but, but on the other hand, help them with, with more efficient um, commercialization um, uh, strategies that would be impossible to, to, to define in a centralized marketing department uh, of an existing carrier in Mexico City. So uh, this is, this is, this is one, one thing that we have seen. I think that it's important to come back to the question of, of whether some desirable objective will be pursued through regulatory tools or through antitrust tools. And I think that uh, uh, universal service and broadband penetration, uh, those, those are more regulatory objectives than antitrust objectives. Antitrust is concerned about uh, ensuring that firms uh, compete robustly to provide the best prices and uh, product choices for consumers. And it's not uh, it's well suited to being a policy tool for building an industry structure that we think would be better than the current industry structure. Uh, I want to come back uh, to uh, the, uh, the actual um, provision of the LFCE that is at issue in, in the Telcel case uh, because I think it has much broader implications for the development of, of Mexican antitrust law. Uh, the price squeeze that uh, Telcel uh, is accused of is what is, uh, at least in the English translation of, of the Spanish uh, text of the statute, it's known as a relative monopolistic practice as opposed to uh, one that, that is um, akin to a per se violation. So 
the relative monopolistic practice has to be uh, evaluated uh, by uh, looking at the, the relevant market and, and ascertaining whether there is uh, market power on the part of the, of the accused firm. And also, an important uh, component of Article 10 is whether or not uh, firms, competitors, are being unduly displaced from the market by the conduct of the accused firm. Uh, let me tie this in now to, to what George was saying a minute ago about what's unique about network industries. They have substantial sunk investments. Uh, and as a consequence, they have large scale, they have typically low marginal cost because uh, once you build the network, you lay the fiber or you build out the, uh, the towers, base stations, uh, the incremental cost of running the network is relatively low. Well, what does that mean in terms of the plausibility of some antitrust theory of monopolization under uh, Article 10 of the statute? What does it mean to displace a firm? This will be an important point of statutory construction in Mexican antitrust law, I'm, I assure you, because if if displacement is really taken to mean exclusion from the market, then exclusion is not a very plausible strategy in a network industry with substantial sunk costs. Let's think first of all about uh, uh, the, the wireline side of the business. If, if the, the wireline incumbent tries to drive out a competitor that's laid some fiber networks, what happens? Well, maybe the competitor uh, goes broke, exits the market, uh, or declares bankruptcy and is taken over by, by somebody else. Well, that, that somebody else now has a lower cost structure and comes right back in and competes. Well, the next time, is the incumbent going to engage in, in the same kind of exclusionary strategy? No, because it knows it, doesn't, it, won't, it won't succeed. So this is like the idea in the predatory pricing cases of recoupment. There's no reason that you're going to uh, set a, a, a price below cost to try to recoup it uh, in the future if the likelihood of recoupment is, is low. Now let's think about the wireless network. Is it really that much different from the, the wireline example that I gave? I don't think so because again the resource, the fundamental resource is spectrum which is completely non-depreciable. doesn't degrade, doesn't rot, doesn't rust. The base stations and towers are, obviously those are physical assets, but they, they don't evaporate if a, an existing wireless carrier were to go bankrupt. We saw this in the United States when WorldCom uh, went bankrupt. Uh, there was a lot of hand-wringing about whether or not uh, the company should be forced to go through liquidation. And my view was, and I, I guess I should give a little background here, WorldCom had engaged in uh, a massive securities fraud that had caused uh, its, its shareholders to lose the value of their investments. It had lied to the, the Federal Communications Commission about uh, traffic statistics that in turn were used to, to make uh, various FCC policies. And the company went into bankruptcy. So should it be reorganized or should it be liquidated? My, my view at the time was just liquidate the thing. Uh, and there was a lot of concern about, oh, well, then you'd lose a long-distance competitor. And I don't think so because the critical infrastructure assets don't depreciate. They are still there to be used by somebody else. And so, in general, uh, you, Article 10 of the LFCE uh, should be uh, read very critically uh, with respect to what displacement means when that uh, part of the statute is being used to examine an infrastructure industry that has these large sunk cost characteristics. Uh, let me go back to Mr. Lucatero's um, example and his point, because uh, I don't quite understand it. I'm, I'm, I think I am as dedicated as you are, maybe not, but I, I would like to, be, like to think I am, to unlocking, to increasing penetration and unlocking these niche markets that haven't been served. That's great. I'm in favor of more uh, penetration and more telecommunications, not less. But, but in your example, what is stopping those niche markets? You, you say someone came to you and said, 
I, I have a, a way of uh, getting, um, uh, of signing people up that's uh, lower cost than anyone else. What's, what's stopping the market from doing this? That is, why are they not able to do this now? Pr price squeeze. Because the, 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 the wholesale price that they get is so high that, uh, that in fact, the market stays, stays the same way. But, it, but how does the price squeeze work if those people are not getting service now? What's the squeeze? Well, I mean, it's not that they're, if Telcel's not serving these people now or nobody else is serving them, there can't be a squeeze. This would be new service to them. Now, maybe they can't all pay for it, but, and, and maybe there's something wrong in the wholesale price, which is a regulatory issue, as Greg pointed out. But if they have no service at all now, there can't be a squeeze. Well, the, the actual problem is the wholesale price. The, 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 the wholesale price is very close to the retail price. So much so that uh, that is not. But, but your, I thought your example was these these niche markets have been, have been receiving no service now, and they can be unlocked in some way. For but example, that can't be a price squeeze issue because there's no price uh, if they're not unlocked. If they're not, not getting no service, there's no price. I'm in favor of providing them service. Now they have to pay the cost of the service, and maybe they're maybe the wholesale price is uh, maybe there's something wrong with the wholesale price. That's a, again a regulatory matter, as Greg points out, not an antitrust matter. But but uh, even you would think if you have people, and we see this in the, U in the U.S. entirely, you have people that have had no service for a long period of time and they, they finally have an opportunity of getting cell phone service, even if the price is high, a lot of, not everyone can afford it, but a lot can and a lot will. Uh, and so, you'd, again, you'd think the competitive opportunities uh, are there. It can't be a price squeeze if there's no service well, to begin with. The argument is if the, if the, if the wholesale price were lower, they would be able to commercialize at a, at a slightly lower price than, than the existing uh, retail price and, uh, and, and find some elasticity in certain niche markets that would be extremely attractive and sizable. But, but the problem is that the but in these price but, but think, and in these it's niche markets, if they don't have any service now... They, they do. The I, I was talking about, I was talking about uh, the, a specific case of, of a base station that will be... that, that has been moved. From a, from, a, from a town because the, the, the existing operator decided that that place was not profitable. I understand. Because they didn't, they didn't have the volume of subscribers that was needed. I understand. And, uh, and, and somebody who came and did an analysis of the market said that if only they had um, a, a much lower uh, wholesale price, they would be able to fill those base stations with subscribers. And, and the numbers are very good, actually. But, you know, this wholesale price has to come from somewhere. It comes from wholesale costs. So, I mean, you just can't, I mean, you, we could say, I mean, it's a, great, it's a great idea. Let's just lower all prices. Let's just reduce all costs so that there's greater penetration. Everyone has greater ass. Everyone has greater access to resources. But that's not realistic in the world. I mean, costs are costs. You can't just, well, somebody has to pay them. Somebody has to pay those costs. You can lower, you, a, a government can, can command a firm to lower costs, but somebody's got to pay those costs. It has to come from, if it's not from that set of consumers, it's from some other set of citizens, it's from some other set of citizens. And this is why we, we have policies that explicitly subsidize service in high cost areas. This is what universal yeah. service is about. So you can ask, right. who, sh who, should, who should receive the, the subsidy and who should pay the subsidy? Let's talk about first who should, re who should receive it. You could pay the, 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 the subsidy to carriers so they can lower, your, lower their price or you could pay the subsidy, I'm sorry, you could pay the subsidy, yes, to carriers so they could lower the price. Or you could pay the subsidy to consumers so that they could pay the full price of what it actually costs to uh, deliver service to them in, in high cost areas. Now, where does the subsidy come from? Well, the subsidy could come from all telecommunications users, all telecommunications carriers, all taxpayers. Why does it come from just uh, the incumbent carrier itself, you know, from its shareholders and ultimately it's it's uh, it's customers um, it's really going to be the customers I mean really the implications of this Telcel decision is uh, the implications are raise prices for Telcel's customers in order to uh, put in a better competitive position Telcel's competitors that's basically the the economics of it so, so going going back to your argument of costs uh, for example there are some companies that have come and told us that the wholesale price that they find in Mexico is higher than the wholesale price they would find in, in, in many European countries. And what, what they are saying is that the, the wholesale price in Mexico is, is, not a, is not just a question of costs. It's something else. Now, we have to figure out what that something else is. 
But uh, what, what they say is that it's, it's much cheaper to buy wholesale connectivity in the United States or, 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 or in Holland or in France or, or in Russia than in Mexico. Now, uh, the network elements are made by the same companies. The, 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 the network management systems are done by the same companies. And, uh, and, and in fact, mobile companies are not that um, 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 labor intensive when you, when you look at them. And when you know the anatomy of a network, this argument of costs doesn't fly very much when you compare the, the cost structure of different operators worldwide. And when you look at the margins that, that, that operators are making in Mexico, you can see that, uh, that if, if uh, mobile virtual operators are working so well in, in France, in Holland, and, and for Sprint in, in the United States, in Germany, I, I, really, I really want to understand why we couldn't make them work here and unleash all those, all those uh, niche markets that are waiting to be served. The, the, in the United States, the Telecommunications Act of 1996 was a very lengthy statute, and in turn it generated uh, many, many rulemaking proceedings at the FCC that resulted in thousands of pages of, of regulatory uh, decisions and, and uh, rules. There was one definition that was missing from the Telecommunications Act of 1996, and that was the definition of cost. I think, and that's what, what led to uh, the, the volume of litigation uh, that produced uh, a number of Supreme Court cases, uh, as well as many lower appellate court cases. This actually is a, is a very deep uh, uh, question of economics. What is cost, and how does cost differ uh, to uh, an engineer uh, and to an economist and even to an accountant? They, they all have different conceptions of what cost is. Uh, to an economist, cost is defined uh, the way Armin Alshin defined it. Uh, he, he's a, uh, a professor at UCLA, and, and his, he defined it in terms of opportunity cost. The, the cost of some action is the value of the, 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 the best opportunity foregone by taking that action. Uh, so in telecommunications, it's very tempting to say, oh, the cost of providing some service is very low. Look, with the, you know, we know there's the sunk cost, and then the incremental costs are quite low. Uh, but the real cost to engaging in a transaction, if you're the, the incumbent firm, is, is not merely covering the incremental costs of the uh, network elements that are used to provide service to your competitor. It's the foregone stream of all the revenues that are associated with, with that transaction, uh, particularly when you might lose the customer relationship as a result of it. It's the nature of pricing within the telecommunications industry that these firms are multi-product uh, uh, companies. Uh, and there are lots of common costs from the, the, the sunk investments that are made in the network that are recovered by different margins, different markups on different products. And these products are used in conjunction with one another. Economists call them complements rather than substitutes. So if you lose a customer, you're not just losing uh, voice wireless service, for example, uh, the revenue stream on that from that customer. You're losing the revenue streams on all the complementary services that that, that customer would, would purchase from you uh, over, over some period of time. Uh, in, uh, in, in a voluntary transaction between the incumbent and an entrant, the price that would be struck would be one that would fully compensate the incumbent for that opportunity cost, for uh, the loss of the revenue stream associated with the loss of the customer. It wouldn't be simply the, the operating costs associated with uh, the termination of that call. So oh. this, this is one really major difference in the way economists look at costs, and, and I think engineers do. Uh, <clears throat> unless George has... Uh, you, Can I respond to Mr. Lukater again? Um, I operate at a much lower level of, of um, uh, ideas than you do. So let me just deal with Mr. Lucatero's uh, much lower level of abstraction. Uh, point about costs in Europe versus costs in Mexico. 
Now, these are a, these are, this is a complicated question, as you, I'm sure you know. Uh, there are lots of differences between Europe and Mexico. Density of population, standard of living, all kinds of differences. I think... Uh, and, Kenya. And, and uh, of course, as, as Greg has pointed out throughout, this is, a regu this is typically a regulatory issue, not an antitrust issue. But there are going to be areas of the population that aren't served. I'll give you, give you a personal example. My wife and I have a small cabin in the mountains of Colorado. Well, this is a niche market that for, to, to which there's now currently no, uh, no penetration. Uh, and why? Because we're not willing to pay the price that it would cost to, to, to put a satellite over this little valley in which we have uh, this uh, small uh, cabin. That's going to happen. Now, I would love to have, uh, it would be, gr I, I wouldn't love it. it. Actually, it would violate every principle I believe in. On the other hand, if the, if the uh, FCC or the, in the U.S. or the antitrust division were to force AT&T to put a satellite over that valley at the expense of AT&T's consumers so I could have uh, penetration, which I, I don't have mobile phone, can't get mobile, mobile phone there. Uh, I'd, that would be a great advantage. Again, as, as I say, it violates every principle I believe in, but it would be a personal advantage in having uh, that service. I think it is very hard for a regulatory agency such as yours to conclude that there are severe market distortions uh, simply based on your observations of differential costs across countries, uh, barriers to entry, and differential uh, competition. And uh, these international co uh, comparisons are very difficult too. You invoke Sprint as, uh, as being successful uh, in dealing with mobile virtual uh, operators. Sprint is in real trouble in the U.S. And as, uh, as many of the, competing, of, of the carriers competing with Telcel here in Mexico, Sprint's strategy has been to complain to the Justice Department about its losing position in uh, mobile telephony and to encourage the Justice Department, which the Justice Department has done, to file a lawsuit against the ATT T-Mobile, proposed ATT T-Mobile uh, merger. Again, an antitrust lawsuit. I don't know where that's going to go, but I, I think it's very hard, one, as I've tried to point out before, listening to competitors, two, as a regulatory agency, to use international comparisons or claims by individual customers that, uh, that penetration is possible or service is possible where the market has not found it possible to provide it. This has been a very lively, as you can imagine, um, discussion among the panelists, but we've left somebody very important out of this discussion, which is you. Uh, so now we open the floor to, qu to questions, and we could, could we have a microphone, please? Um, so we want to take them up, come on up with the microphone. Uh, because unless a microphone is used, you don't hear the question. If you hear the answer, you're just as confused as before the question was asked. No. I'll give it to this gentleman. Please identify yourself and, uh, and, and state your question. Right. Sure thing. Armando Chacon with the Mexican Institute for Competitiveness. Well, I, I know this is the price quiz panel, but uh, you, touched, you touched several times on the issue of, uh, of the spectrum allocation. So I would really like to hear what, uh, in your view, like the, the main, the main uh, deficiencies of, of how we're doing that as, you know, relative to the ideal way of doing it. That's you. <laughs> Senor Lucatero. Oh, but, well, the ideal, the ideal way, um, what you have is that uh, there, is, there is good spectrum and not so good spectrum and bad spectrum. And, um, and the fact is that depending on what spectrum you have and how much spectrum you have is what you can do with it. If you have a spectrum in the high, frequency, in the high frequencies, the probability of going through a wall is much lower than if you have a spectrum in the, in, in the, in the lower frequency bands. So that's something that has to be considered. Now, um, as, as mobile internet becomes more prominent and as, as the prices of, of smartphones um, gets lower and lower, the, um, we, can, we foresee a, a very strong adoption of mobile internet that implies that we will have to have very large contiguous blocks of spectrum that will have to be allocated to, different, uh, to the different players in Mexico sometime in the future. And, uh, and, uh, and, and the question is, how do, we, how do we cope with the existing spectrum assets that operator ha operators have today, the, n the new spectrum assets that will be needed to deliver mobile broadband, and to do that in a, in a manner that is fair and allows them to compete on the same grounds. 
Yeah, but uh, you know, in terms of the fishing rule, in a way that will achieve the common goal of, of increasing penetration or you know, the, the quality or quantity of services provided. Well, uh, I'll simply say that uh, th this is a topic that Ronald Coase wrote about in the 1950s, uh, the importance of having property rights in spectrum and, and, yeah, and, and making, making those, those property rights marketable. Uh, there are a lot of um, more technical questions. Do, should, you, should you auction the spectrum? Should you have a pure price auction or some combination of a beauty contest and, and an auction? If you're going to have an auction, uh, what's the design of the auction? Uh, and there's, uh, there's a lot of experience on that uh, in the last 15 years. Uh, uh, to be honest, I don't know uh, uh, which of those techniques uh, Mexico is is uh, using right now, so I, 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 I can't comment further. George, you got something to say? No. No, okay. Just, just one, uh, one another other question over here. Mr. Mr. Lucatero. Oh, yeah. Uh, so, but something that, something that we'll, we will not miss next time will be coverage and capacity obligations. We, I mean, in, in, in most countries in the world, operators have coverage and capacity obligations that are much stronger than that what we have in Mexico. So this is, this is, a, this is a topic that we will study with, 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 with a lot of uh, detail. That will increase the, the, the entry barriers in a way, I think. Sure. All right. Would, thank you very much for that question. Please identify yourself and... Uh, thank you. Thank you. No? Well, my name is Alberto Mansur, and I have a loud voice, so I can speak without the microphone. Uh, I want to make an abstraction from the Telcel case, because I think this is a, a, a policy issue, and not just a, a central case issue. And my question mainly goes to Mr. Lucatero. I, I want to understand if the policy for, for we're initiating the price squeeze actions is we want, we have a desirable social outcome like this, like the coverage that you stated. Why don't, why, if that is the case, and, and we want to enforce it through taking money from the consumers and benefiting the competitors in order for the competitors, in the hope that the competitors grow their infrastructure and, and cover this social market, if that is the case, then why doesn't the, the why is it not replicated in other industries? For example, there is a, a desirable it could be desirable policy to sponsor a, a cultural television channel. Why not take money? Why, why not why not initiate a, a price quiz action or and take money from Televisas and, and, and TV Aztecas? Uh, customers in order for us to boost a cultural channel or a sports channel or, or whatever. Is this, is this the policy that, that, we're, that we can expect? No. That's the answer. Why? Well, uh, the, the fact is that we, I mean, what has been done is not in order to, to, to boost connectivity. And, um, and that, that, that is the result of, uh, of, of some interconnection uh, 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 um, dilemmas, uh, uh, some interconnection uh, issues between operators. So, that, and that, that was resolved by COFECO, not by COFETEL. So, I think that COFECO should be the one that actually expresses uh, uh, herself uh, about this. But, uh, but in general, I would say that uh, our policy is not to go hurting operators in order to make them uh, uh, deploy more networks. We want the market to be a vibrant market, and uh, and, uh, and and what we want to do is is not to impose, to, to find tricks in order to, to, to make operators deploy more networks. We want, we want networks to be profit-driven. That contradicts your little town position. No, uh, it, it, it's not. Uh, there are some people who think that subscriber acquisition costs m ca can be much lower if, uh, if the, uh, to, to, to the subscriber acquisition costs and, and subscriber retention costs that an, an operator uh, has in certain areas of Mexico where they don't have any market knowledge. So it's, it's, it's an information asymmetry, and as, as supply and demand uh, um, um, defragmentation that, that can be done through local knowledge. So market-driven, profit-driven, 100%. Thank you. 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 Thank you
Any other questions? Gentleman over there, give him the microphone. Okay. Yes. Um, hello. Um, good afternoon. And my question is uh, for Mr. Zizak. Uh, uh, he, he told us that um, uh, to prosecute a margin squeeze um, liability, um, um, it was a, a bad uh, antitrust policy and that was best addressed by um, regulatory policy. And my question is um, if poor is the best uh, and um, this comes from, it, it, my question is more to give you a, a background of the, the Mexican regulatory and antitrust uh, background. Uh, I mean, um, how do you say, uh, out, uh, outlook. Uh, if you, do, you have not any result from a regulatory action, uh, would you consider this antitrust uh, prosecution to be, uh, even though if it, it is a, a poor policy, to be a uh, the best one in the, given the restrictions uh, we face in the country? Well, as, as I said uh, earlier, the, the, the big difficulty uh, with <coughs> I think, uh, using a margin squeeze theory in antitrust law as a way to um, advance consumer welfare is that uh, you, you are, uh, you are taking away a price reduction today that would flow to the benefit of consumers in the hope that the competitors will be made stronger so that in the future they can lower their price and pay back that, that discount to consumers and then more on top of that. So it seems to me that that's uh, a very uh, improbable scenario if you, if you just go through the calculations of the present values involved. You're, you're foregoing benefits today in the hope of achieving essentially an identical benefit in the future. So you've got to discount it to its present value. But is the benefit in the future even likely to occur? Again, if uh, private firms in an oligopolistic industry got together and s said to the uh, largest firm, please raise your price so that we don't have to um, uh, uh, suffer losses. We can all, we can all have a, a, a more comfortable, profitable uh, result here. That would be a price-fixing conspiracy. Um, and yet, that's the incentive that's created through government intervention uh, in the form of imposing liability uh, for price squeeze. Now, in essence, what happens is you change the, the way prices get determined in an oligopolistic market. Uh, and you end up with a higher equilibrium price than you would in the absence of the threat of an antitrust penalty in the event of, of that the, the uh, leading firm uh, uh, fails to raise its retail price. What's the likelihood that in the future a price war would ever break out if the competitors have successfully gone to the antitrust regulator and got the antitrust regulator to essentially install this new kind of equilibrium uh, between uh, the competitors so that they're, uh, the price umbrella that George was talking about has been opened up and is now shielding the smaller, less efficient firms. I just don't see the, the, the likelihood of the benefit in the second period of that model ever occurring. The price, price war is not going to break out in the future, so you're never going to recoup what you're sacrificing today in terms of consumers having to pay higher prices. And it's not just a, it's not just a sacrifice either. You're, uh, you're compelling uh, raising a price, not just forestalling yes, lowering yes, price. Yes, exactly. Makes it even worse. So, so I don't think that the, the presence or absence of, of uh, the regulation fundamentally changes uh, that detrimental impact to consumers uh, uh, in the downstream market. Do you want to pick up the microphone, the gentleman? Over here? No, it's, uh, over here. 
All right, next one. Can you hear me? Yeah. No. Mm -hmm. not, not with the mic. I, I have a loud voice also. And the question is uh, to Louise. Now, can you hear me? No. We all know that we want the best possible quality product at the lowest price as consumers. Right now, here in Mexico, probably our, one of our largest companies, if not largest, is Walmart and Mexico. Uh, Walmart right now is, is moving into the market very strongly, building new stores and everything. Here in the federal district, our mayor has come up with possible new regulations and everything. Basically telling Walmart, you can't build a store within X kilometers of existing Mexican retailers, okay? Uh, some of us here work with clients like Walmart and everything like that. My question on this is first, does this regulation or legislation have any future in Mexico City? And secondly, can it go ahead and spread to the other 31 states? Second question is, uh, as U.S. companies operating in Mexico, we find our telephone bills long distance among the highest in the world of what we pay here. Our telephone bills long distance cost more than a room in four seasons. <laughs> Is there going to be any regulation to protect the consumer or not and bringing it down to a more realistic worldwide rate? This is, this is, this is, I, I love your second question. I hate the first question. Uh, I, the, the first question is not my competence. I, I, I don't deal with supermarkets. I, I deal with... Well, it, 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 it's not so much supermarkets. It's the concept of government intervention basically telling a retail chain... Well, you know, price. something something that... Can you hear me now? Yes. Yeah. The, 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 the question is basically the government intervention by the federal district of telling a retailer that he cannot build their operations close to other retailers. I mean, is this going forward? I'm going to tell you about Cofetel. Uh, and our our philosophy, the, well, the, the philosophy that uh, that comes with the with the coffee tail that that uh, that happened after Moni de Swan took office, I don't know about before, um, but uh, we we want a profit-driven telecommunications market. We don't we don't and, and we don't like subsidies. We we want we want operators to be profitable, and we want the, and we want the cake of telecommunications to grow. And we have studied the market, and we believe that it can grow, and that and that and the market can can extract more, much more value than what it extracts today. And uh, we don't want to do intervention in a manner that that hurts. What we want to do is to create incentives so that um, so that this this market becomes more more vibrant. We we don't want to hurt the 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 sizable amount of money that is generated by by mobile operators and and by, and by fixed operators. You know. A, 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 a noticeable part of, of the gross domestic product of Mexico is generated by telecommunications, and we don't want that to go down. So intervention, I don't, I don't really think it will happen. I think that we will, we will try to create some incentives uh, for competition, and uh, but but intervention as such. And, in, and the long distance shell. rates, the long distance within the telecommunications. Well. Um, I think that the, here again there is a problem of costs. Uh, I, I really believe that when, when you look at, uh, at uh, when you compare a Skype um, um, call and a, and, a, and a call that you make from 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 a mobile phone or a fixed phone to to, other, to another country, you just you just realize that there is there is a problem here, and uh, and something that happens is that Mexico has a very strange regulation for long for long distance. It's a in in Mexico it's illegal to be efficient. <laughs> you know, it, I mean, so we we really have to fix the law. There, I mean, there there are some changes that have to be done. If you look at the at, at the at this reglamento de larga distancia, it's really bizarre. <coughs> honestly, I mean, and uh, and when you look at and when you see that when you call from France to Australia from fix to fix, uh, in most carriers, you can call as much as you want and uh, and uh, and, uh, and and you just pay your your, your uh, a fixed monthly fee. I think that we have things to fix in this realm. Yeah, oh, just one final comment, as, as most of us here are lawyers and everything. The, the two constitutions, the Mexican and the U.S., are very similar in, in many aspects and everything. The big difference that I've seen in, in my 30 years in this country is the application of the law doesn't really exist. And I think that's something that has to really, you know, go forward. 
because a, a lot of us, you know, right here, particularly in the aspect of security, are getting very concerned about what's happening in the country. Thank you. Yes, thank you. Uh, Benjamin Contreras uh, from the Federal Competition Commission. Uh, I, I have a couple of comments and, and maybe it would be applied to several of the panelists uh, and, and see what reaction will they have. Uh, in the first, in the regulatory side of the Federal uh, Telecommunications Act in Mexico, uh, uh, there is a figure of permissionarios or several services that uh, can be given only with a permit, not the concession act. And it seems that this sort of mobile virtual operators can work with this sort of permits under this law uh, to, to give these sort of services. And uh, however, uh, the reglamento, the by the bylaws, of that part of the law is sort of not regulated. It has not come out. Uh, second, I, I think that the verticality issue that is addressed in the price squeeze that uh, is being addressed in this panel is sort of different in the Alcoa case, the Telcel case, and also for the mobile virtual operators. Uh, uh, probably the mo mobile virtual operators are more similar to the Alcoa case. Uh, in, in the Telcel case, it seems that the verticality or, or, or the price squeeze margin or whatever that is being addressed here is similar. It's sort of a lateral services that has to be rendered and uh, in order for users in one network to communicate with the users in the other network. And, and maybe, I, I don't know, probably that uh, difference uh, makes us address this problem a bit different. And, and then the, the following question in here that uh, I've been asking myself uh, while listening uh, uh, about whether the margin squeeze rule, anti-competitive margin squeeze rule, uh, whether it's, it is a wise rule or not, uh, it, it probably should be addressed more in a sense that whether we should have that rule or eliminate it. Uh, right now, in our competition law, we have the rule. It, it's not a discussion of whether we should put it or, or take it out then we, we have to see the processes on which this rule of reason has to be applied uh, in different cases, maybe a Alcoa case or a mobile virtual operator case or the Telcel case, which I think is a bit different sort of verticality than the Alcoa case and I don't know what the reactions would be from the panelists in the table. Uh, there are some differences. I don't know if they're important differences from an economic point of view. They're, they're, uh, certainly you're right with this, uh, identifying this. Uh, let me talk to you about the verticality point. Um, uh, I, I, there, are, there are some differences in fact there, but I'm not sure from an economic point of view they're important differences in the sense that there are costs of inter-network uh, connection. Uh, it's not free. There have to be have to be investments made and maintained over time. Now there's a, there is a regulatory question as to what those costs are, but it, at any rate the example I gave, uh, the simple economic example I think holds for that case too. That is if there's if there is a comparative advantage that some other network has of connecting with the largest firm's network, then the largest firm will want to take advantage of that. Uh, even though that's different, you're, you're right, it's different from Alcoa and fabricating in, in actual fact. I don't think econ in terms of economic incentives, uh, it's that much different. So that I think the, the basic analysis that I presented of the advantages to the largest firm uh, or the potential advantages to the largest firm where there are such advantages, 
of connecting with competitors uh, still uh, still holds. Anybody else? I've drawn a picture of the difference, but I can't put it in words. <laughs> uh, you can't put it in pictures very well either. Right? <laughs> <laughs> Uh, I look at my, uh, my watch here, and, and it's time for us to take a break before we go into lunch. So uh, would you please join me in thanking the panel for a very stimulating conversation?